Well, hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. We're delighted for you to be joining us today from wherever you are. Um, we really just, uh, as always, we wanna encourage you to join in on the conversation. There's a chat box to the right of your screen. Just encourage uh, you to utilize that. In the very beginning, if you'll just type in your name and perhaps where you're located around the world, and also just encourage you to utilize it during the presentation and at the end when we dedicate uh, some time to Q&A. So before we get started and I introduce our speaker today, I just wanna open up in a word of prayer. So please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for uh, this day. We thank you, God, um, for the opportunities that you give us. Uh, Lord, here at Samaritan's Purse, just to utilize medicine, um, Lord, just as a vehicle uh, to uh, share the gospel all around the world. Lord, I just thank you for Dr. Chang and um, him just to taking the time uh, to be with us today and just share his expertise. Just be with him and speak through him. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So uh, today I'm really delighted to introduce to you uh, Dr. Stanley Chang. Um, and his presentation today will be radiology and telemedicine in the Mission Hospital. You know, um, telemedicine has just exploded during the pandemic, and Dr. Chang, really, I'd call him an expert. Um, he's a diagnostic radiologist. He practices uh, in San Diego, California. And over the past decade, he has taken multiple short-term trips uh, to Tenwick Hospital uh, in Kenya. He has also uh, conducted teaching for radiology attendings and residents at Myung Christian uh, Medical Center and uh, St. Paul Hospital in Ethiopia. In 2014, he also helped to establish Tenwick Hospital's teleradiology program and continues to coordinate uh, this very robust program to this day. He also serves as radiology co-champion for Friends of Tenwick, helping to support and develop Tenwick's radiology department. So, just uh, Dr. Chang, we're so delighted to have you um, uh, join us today and, um, and, and present this, uh, this presentation. So uh, at this time, I'm just going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it really is an honor for me to have the opportunity today to share a bit about uh, my experience in radiology and telemedicine, specifically teleradiology in the Mission Hospital setting. Um, and, you know, when I uh, was uh, applying to medical school, you know, really was interested in uh, going into, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, having short term medical missions, uh, being part of uh, uh, some time in my career. Um, and I kind of envisioned perhaps going into something like surgery, uh, you know, where I felt like that was something that would, uh, you know, really translate over to uh, uh, the mission field. Uh, but, you know, when I got into medical school and was kind of introduced to uh, uh, medical imaging and, you know, first year anatomy uh, courses, I really got fascinated by our, the field of radiology and really kind of fell in love with that field and became a radiologist. And, uh, you know, one of the things, though, that, um, you know, as I, you know, you know, continue my career in radiology, you know, I wasn't so sure that there would be that, you know, many you know, opportunities to, um, to engage in the mission field. But, you know, um, in uh, 2012, I, you know, I was on the World uh, Medical Mission website, and I, I, to much to my surprise, I, you know, there was an, you know, I, there was a listed a couple of urgent needs for uh, radiologists. Um, um, at that time, it was at Kajabi Hospital and Tenwick Hospital in Kenya. So, you know, it really piqued my interest. I, you know, um, I looked into it, and uh, yeah, and, and a year later, um, I was, able, you know, I had had the privilege to go to uh, Tenwick Hospital for the very first time, and. Uh, uh, to uh, serve, um, you know, a, a couple week uh, medical mission in radiology, and that was really just a, you know, just a really wonderful experience, and um, and uh, you know, just really opened my eyes to you know the significant roles that radiologists could now play, like in the mission hospital setting, especially with uh, more advanced imaging such as CT scans, especially CT scanner being available for mission hospitals, and you know, probably down the road MRI, and so with that. Um, I'm going to today just um, discuss, uh, you know, about radiology and teleradiology, specifically sharing from my experience at Tenwick Hospital in Kenya. Um, although I think that a lot of the uh, the experiences uh, there that you know from Tenwick are very you know are applicable to uh, mission hospitals, you know, around the world, um, um, because there's going to be some similarities with that, um, depending on where you know each hospital is at in the, you know the development of their radiology program. So I'm going to start out just kind of giving an overview of, of, of Tenwick Hospital, which is located in Kenya. Um, and then I'll dive into the, the role of the radiologist specifically on site um, serving at Tenwick Hospital. And then um, move on to 
teleradiology, um, kind of talk about some of the broad you know, technical parameters uh, for performing teleradiology, as well as um, how we developed the teleradiology program uh, to help support Tenemec Hospital when there's no radiologist that's uh, visiting on site. And then I'll finally, I'll conclude with some, uh, some of the future directions for uh, teleradiology um, uh, that we're trying to develop as well. So Tenwick, as I mentioned, is located in Kenya, and then Kenya is a sub-Saharan, uh, uh, in sub-Saharan East Africa along the equator. It's a, a country of about 52 million people, um, and uh, the World Bank uh, classifies Kenya as a lower middle income country. And a little more than a third of Kenyans uh, live uh, below the uh, poverty line. Now, I'm not a, an expert in, you know, in, in the healthcare delivery in Kenya or, you know, global health, but I just wanted to give you a quick, you know, 30,000 uh, foot, uh, so to speak, overview of healthcare in Kenya. And uh, so, first of all, it should be said that, you know, the Kenyan government does value providing, um, you know, quality healthcare for its um, citizens. I mean, that's evidenced by, for example, some sanitation and clean water initiatives to really improve, you know, public health in, in many ways. However, um, uh, quality healthcare, um, you know, continues to remain in limited, you know, there's uh, limitations in access for many, especially those that are living in the, uh, the uh, rural areas of Kenya. Um, and, uh, you know, several of the, uh, the barriers to, you know, to um, access to healthcare center around first, just simply transportation and distances that uh, the patients have to travel to the hospitals. Um, you know, a lot of uh, patients, you know, um, need to rely on public transportation. And oftentimes, you know, they, you know, they're traveling in large buses that, you know, have significant delays and, or it takes a long time from get from place to place as they wait to perhaps fill up the entire bus before they'll, you know, they'll continue on their journey. Um, it's, um, it's challenging. A lot of times you can't travel at night um, just because, um, the transportation is not available or it's dangerous. And so that further reduces the amount number of hours, you know, in a day uh, the patients can travel um, to receive health care. Uh, certainly um, it goes without saying that there are financial barriers. You know, a lot of patients, you know, need to pay um, for um, directly out of pocket for their medical services. Um, and uh, so again, that can, you know, dissuade patients from getting uh, timely health care or even health care um, um, as needed. And finally, there is, you know, just human resources are, are limited in terms of physicians um, overall in Kenya. I mean, there's a lack of physician availability in many of the hospitals. And, uh, you know, frequently patients will, you know, have to be, you know, will be seen in, in busy hospital settings by, you know, equivalent of physician's assistants or nurses, um, which have, again, further impacts um, the access to the healthcare that, that um, many of these patients are, you know, presenting with really advanced diseases, um, you know, the type of healthcare they might require. Now, more specific to radiology, I would say cost is probably one of the main barriers to, um, for patients to get an imaging workup, and then which consequently, you know, translates into um, uh, 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 impacting their, you know, the, you know getting uh, medical treatment. So uh, patients, um, you know, uh, for example, at Tenwick need to pay in advance for radiology studies. And at times, uh, patients will need to sell a cow or, you know, or land just to raise funds for a single CT scan that they might require, you know, in their further diagnosis. Um, sometimes patients will, you know, you know, will have to return to their community and try to raise the funds among, um, you know, their, uh, their uh, village. Uh, and just to put it um, in perspective, a CT uh, cost at Tenwick Hospital ranges somewhere between seventy and one hundred sixty dollars uh, U.S. And that's for a single CT scan. That the price varies depending on the complexity and type of CT scan that they're they're receiving. Um, and um, though this is lower than sort of the quote retail price of what the imaging would cost in the United States, it's still a significant um, sum of money. So this results in patients, you know, perhaps being lost to follow up. Um, as you know, they either you know they need to go and raise the funds, or they're not able to to raise the funds, and and consequently, patients may you know not get you know their their imaging workup at all, and and their their medical uh, treatment then suffers because of that, or there are, there can be delays in you know getting their their imaging uh, their CT scan, for example, and then um, you know they they come back finally when they're able to get it when their disease is much more advanced and maybe less treatable, and then the other thing is that. There is a limited number of radiologists um, in, the, in the country. It's estimated there are approximately 200 radiologists in Kenya. And to kind of put this in perspective compared to what you know, we have in the United States in terms of access to radiologists, it, I live in the county of San Diego. Uh, it's about, there's roughly 3 million a population. So compare that to a population in Kenya, which is over 50 million. 
And uh, I would say that in uh, just as a conservative estimate, there's probably roughly four, at least 400 radiologists in uh, San Diego. So significantly, not, um, you know, a larger number of radiologists um, per capita here in the United States. And also, so not only does that, you know, translate into, you know, having radiologists available to interpret imaging, but with fewer radiologists comes, you know, fewer just imaging centers and, and, and equipment, et cetera. So that again, further limits, um, you know, the access that the radio uh, that, that the patients have to getting, um, you know, imaging care, which now, as, as we know, is a, is a, is a very critical part, um, you know, of the, uh, of the medical workup and treatment and for, for many, many different disease processes. So um, Tenwick Hospital is, uh, um, it began in 1937 and actually it was started as just a single uh, room dispensary run by a nurse who would provide, you know, basic medications and basic medical care. And then in 1959, um, the hospital, uh, you know, the first physician, Dr. Ernie Sturry came to the hospital and under his leadership over the years, um, it, it really has, has grown and now is one of the largest uh, mission hospitals in all of Africa. Um, it's a 360 bed teaching hospital that's operated by the African uh, Gospel Church. Um, and, uh, and really is, uh, you know, the motto for Tenwick Hospitals, we treat Jesus heals. And really, they, you know, not only do they want it to, uh, you know, treat, um, you know, physical and help people with their, you know, their physical needs, but also their spiritual needs. So it's a really special um, place. Um, and uh, serves a regional population of approximately 600,000. You can see here on the map that's located um, actually in rural Kenya, um, approximately a four hour drive from Nairobi. So again, it, you know, helping out you know, by, by Tenwick Hospital and many of the mission hospitals in these rural areas really help address that one of those healthcare challenges is, which is the distance uh, needed to travel. And, um, and so, uh, it, it, but not only does it serve that regional population um, of 600,000, it also is a referral center for all of Kenya as well as neighboring countries, especially for you know, some of the advanced uh, cardiothoracic surgeries and neurosurgeries. Um, it's a very busy place. Um, they have 190,000 outpatient and uh, 13,000 inpatient visits annually um, and over 3,000 major surgeries uh, performed um, per year. And one of the special things about Tenwick Hospital is it has multiple residency training programs raising up the next uh, generation of Kenyan and African physicians who in turn you know, will often go and serve in other mission hospitals, uh, you know, either in Kenya or in neighboring uh, countries. And so currently there are residency uh, programs in family practice, orthopedic surgery, general sur surgery, uh, neurosurgery, OBGYN. Um, uh, there's also a fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery, uh, as well as nursing and chaplaincy schools. And so this gives opportunity for both, you know, radiologists and other physicians to, to also have an opportunity serving at Tenwick to, uh, to uh, um, help, you know, be a part of the training, um, you know, in these multiple residency programs. Um, the hospital continues to grow, and the next uh, major initiative, um, which is currently um, ongoing, is uh, the the, uh, the construction of the, the new cardiothoracic care center, which will be a hospital located, you know, ten minute walk from the main um, hospital campus, and this will be dedicated to treating uh, heart disease as well as esophageal cancer, which are two uh, very prevalent disease processes um, in that area. And uh, there'll be six operating rooms for this hospital, a um, hundred bed, it's gonna be a hundred bed hospital in of itself, including 32 ICU beds. And from an imaging perspective, this is gonna be the next major advance um, in terms of uh, radiology capabilities. There'll be another CT scanner um, that will be installed. And this CT scanner will allow for actually performing some advanced um, uh, cardiac imaging, um, you know, in keeping with the, uh, the cardiothoracic care center. Um, there's also um, plans to put in an MRI scanner, which will be the first MRI scanner for Tenwick Hospital, as well as angiography suites, um, which will support both interventional cardiology as well as um, um, interventional radiology. And now um, um, I want to get into just the, the specifics of the radiology department um, at Tenwick Hospital. So um, in terms of the radiology equipment that we have there, um, currently the, uh, uh, the most advanced uh, uh, imaging equipment is a CT scanner. Um, we have a 64 slice a Siemens go up uh, scanner that was installed in 2018. Um, actually, the first CT scanner that was installed at Tenwick Hospital was in 2012. Um, and that was uh, a, a donated uh, to a, a CT scanner from Toshiba. 
And, and basically by it, around uh, 2017 or so, we re uh, realized the scanner was going to you know, need to be replaced. And so we've been very fortunate to have this high quality scanner now from uh, Siemens. It really actually um, has advanced our imaging now. And we were able to provide most of the bread and butter um, types of CT scans that one would, um, would order in a, any uh, hospital in the United States. Um, we can uh, now perform you know, angi CT angiography of the head and neck and CT um, angiography looking for pulmonary embolism. So that has really significantly advanced um, the, uh, the radiology capabilities of the hospital. Um, along with that, um, we, uh, the, the hospital also has, um, you know, conducts plain films um, and also um, has multiple ultrasound scanners. And all these images are, uh, are stored locally digitally. Um, and so they're uh, transferable and viewable throughout the hospital. Um, uh, um, via the, um, com the computer system. So no longer are they printing out, uh, they're not printing out the uh, hard copies of the scans. Um, there is no MRI scanner um, at the hospital. As I mentioned, um, we're anticipating that, the, uh, that with the new cardiothoracic hospital that an MRI scanner will be installed. And so that'll be the next uh, major uh, sort of advance in the, uh, in the imaging capabilities of the hospital. Um, and, uh, and just a little bit on this, this uh, you know, the IT infrastructure of the hospital to help support both radiology and, and the rest of the hospital is that the, uh, the radiology reports um, along with progress notes um, you know, for the, you know, the clinical uh, services are all stored. Um, the hospital does have an electronic health record. They just recently upgraded to a new uh, system from um, IT dose. Um, also, the images are stored on a local PAC system, um, which is, uh, again, the repository where all the, all the imaging uh, files are stored, and they can then be brought up um, you know, within you know, the system on any computer um, within the hospital. Um, and one thing to note is that there is no uh, radiologist on staff. Um, so uh, you know, it, it, so the, the role when the radiologist uh, travels on site is quite significant, because otherwise there is no radiologist um, uh, you know, overseeing the department. And then that's where the te our teleradiology program came in as well as when, um, you know, typically there's about four to six months of uh, on-site volunteer radiologists. And so in, in the months when there's no radiologist available, we, uh, we cover the hospital via teleradiology. So the roles of the volunteer uh, radiologists, um, you know, a lot of this matches what, you know, the role of the radiologist would be um, here in the United States. I mean, you know, the mainstay for, uh, radiologists, um, you know, it's kind of what we're getting paid for, uh, is to, to, to report, to, to create a formal report um, for the imaging studies. At, at Tenwick Hospital in particular, uh, we, the, the, the major responsibility for um, interpretation lies in, uh, in reporting all the CT scans. And you can see from a couple of these screenshot examples, the CT scans can be quite complicated there. Um, so, um, then along with that, the, the radiologist doesn't necessarily do reporting for ever, you know, write a report for every single uh, plane film or every single ultrasound. In fact, it's um, ultrasounds, um, you know, typically are uh, in uh, at Tenwick are uh, are uh, reported by the ultrasound technologist. Though the, uh, the radiologist does have opportunities for for more complex plane films as, or complex ultrasounds to uh, to help in interpretation uh, for the ultrasounds. Radiologists have. Um, can go in, will often go into the room and help um, the, the ultrasound technologists with scanning and as needed can uh, report those ultrasounds formally. Um, uh, I'd say another major role the radiologist is actually being available for um, just face-to-face -face, uh, consultations on the imaging. You know, a lot of times, you know, the radiology reports, you know, um, you will obviously go through all the findings and do an analysis with the impression, but you know, I think it's very, very important, uh, you know, to, for the radiologist to be available to the clinicians to go ahead and discuss, um, you know, some of the nuances within the imaging, explain the significance of the findings, and also to help guide uh, the, uh, uh, the potential uh, further imaging workup or biopsy, et cetera. Um, and so uh, I would say that the radiologist really becomes, uh, you know, a very integral part of the medical team there. Um, you can see in the picture below that, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, different, uh, uh, clinicians in the, in the office with the radiologist um, you know, reviewing uh, scans. And um, I, I would say that, you know, probably more so than in the United States, I feel like when I'm, when I'm there, you know, really part of the, an integral part of the team, I think perhaps part of it is, you know, since there's not a um, on-site radiologist, the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the clinicians really like to take advantage of having, you know, the opportunity to have a radiologist and really kind of dive deeper into, um, you know, how to interpret the imaging and all of that and, and the significance of the findings. Um, percutaneous procedures are also another role of the radiologist. Uh, 
your, um, so ultrasound guided and CT guided biopsies, as well as placements of, of drainages, drainage catheters um, are opportunities. I mean, and with the, uh, um, it, you know, more interventional radiology may then be feasible with the, uh, with the cardiothoracic center uh, installing some angiography suites. So that's an area that, that can continue to grow as well. I'd say teaching is another um, area that, uh, that an important role that a radiologist can play there. Um, you know, for, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there's multiple residency programs there. And nowadays, you know, a, a good working knowledge of image, you know, the, the uh, capabilities of imaging, limitations of imaging, and how to even just do some basic interpretation of imaging is, uh, is uh, critical for, um, for clinicians. And uh, so there's, there's opportunities for radiologists to give didactic lectures and also just teaching, you know, um, you know, through uh, multidisciplinary conferences or just reviewing films. Um, along with that, the, beyond just the, 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 uh, the residents, uh, the medical residents, there's also um, the training technologists in best practices um, and in, in obtaining um, good image quality is also another um, area that radiologists can uh, help out with quite a bit. I mean, because uh, putting, you know, just getting good images is more than just putting a, you know, patient on the CT scanner and pushing a button. And so I, I think radiologists have an opportunity to really help in just really improving the quality of images, as, um, imaging and the, pro and the product. And that in turn, uh, you know, helps us, you know, to do a better interpretation and uh, allow for, uh, you know, a more, a, a greater impact um, on, uh, on the medical care. And finally, there's opportunities for developmental, uh, department development. Um, just, uh, you know, for example, a lot of this equipment um, is expensive and as, as uh, different ho hospitals are considering how they want to, you know, advance um, their, uh, um, their imaging capabilities, perhaps with a new CT scanner or an MRI, um, radiologists have an opportunity to play a significant role in um, guiding decisions and, um, and talking about, you know, the, you know, looking at the needs of the hospital and determining whether, you know, a certain type of equipment would be able to fill that. I think certainly, you know, in Tenwick in particular, as we move towards having you know, some, doing some cardiac CT imaging and, uh, and MRI imaging, and this is a, a role that's going to continue to grow where, um, you know, a lot of these are very subspecialized areas of radiology. And so there are, you know, a lot of opportunities for a radiologist to share their expertise and helping to develop protocols and, and, uh, and, uh, um, the capabilities in some of these uh, niche sort of advanced imaging areas. So now I'm just going to trans um, to uh, you know, uh, segue into teleradiology, and um, before and as I mentioned that uh, you know when there's no radiologist on staff, we you know we need to you know, we cover the help cover the hospital some of the functions of the, the radiologist via teleradiology. Um, but before I kind of go into all the details and in, in, in sharing about, you know, how we develop the program and, and the program that we're using at, at Tenwick Hospital, I thought I'd just go into some broad technical considerations uh, for teleradiology. So first of all, it goes without saying that you need some kind of internet connectivity. You need a way to get these digital, um, this digital images, the information, you know, from the hospital to the, the internet and so that they're accessible for um, radiologists remotely. Um, and, you know, one of the, you know, the, the issues that challenges a lot of the mission hospitals, because they're often in uh, remote areas, kind of low resource settings, is internet bandwidth. Uh, and depending on how the teleradiology or, um, is performed, you can actually, um, it, actually surprisingly, um, can perform, we were able to perform it with a relatively low bandwidth. Um, and, uh, you know, at Tenwick Hospital, when we first started doing teleradiology, I believe the bandwidth for the hospital was somewhere... Um, Around four megabits per second. This is for the entire hospital, um, and you know, the, you know, to put that in perspective compared to you know, in the United States now we're talking. You know, most people have at least fifty to one hundred megabits per second for their residential internet. Um, some more, and you know, even uh, some places are offering. Some providers in the United States are providing gigabit uh, per second uh, internet capability for uh, you know for uh, home uh, internet. Um, but, but nevertheless, um, actually, you know, the, uh, the, we can, uh, we can, we were able to provide the, uh, uh, the teleradiology services with a very limited bandwidth initially. And then the bandwidth has uh, for internet has improved, but it's still, um, you know, not, not quite the, you know, the same as what we even um, get here as, as a, re in a residence, uh, internet here in the United States. So the next thing you need it to do is you have to have a method to view the images remotely. Um, at the most basic level, um, you know, one could actually take a picture of a, uh, uh, you know, of, of an image, you know, either hard copy or on the screen and then send it via an email to a radiologist 
to take a look at and, and or perhaps you know, use their, their phone and do a video um, recording of the scroll through uh, of CT scan or, um, or an MRI scan. And I have been the recipient of some of those. And there is, there is some limited, um, we can give some, you know, a radiologist can give some information um, based on, uh, you, know, a, uh, you know, a photograph or, you know, a scroll through of images. But, but really for the radiologist to properly and thoroughly um, analyze a CT scan, it's really critical to have the ability for the radiologist to manipulate the images um, in, in different ways, to scroll through them one by one, to mag uh, magnify certain areas, um, to be able to have good image quality, as well as, um, um, as, well as um, uh, being able to what we call window and level, for example, which means that you know, for CT scans, we have different settings on the same image where we can emphasize the way the bones look, and then we can get a good look at the bones. We emphasize the way the brain looks, and we can take a look at the brain. And so, what, what, so the ideal um, uh, way to transfer images is to transfer them in their native format, which is called DICOM images. That's a, 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 an acronym that sound, stands for Diagnostic Imaging Communications in Medicine. And basically, that's the, uh, the format um, analogous to like JPEG for, uh, you, know, for, for you know, just for our normal photographs that we take. That, um, that all imaging, whether it's MRI, CT, or plain films are stored in, in digitally in the United States, uh, just worldwide actually. And, um, and so these DICOM images, um, you need to, to, the ideal is to transfer DICOM images. Then the, uh, the next thing is you need to special, uh, an image viewer that can, um, can view the DICOM images. Um, and then once you can do that, then the radiologists um, are, are capable of viewing the images kind of in their native format the same way um, so, and be able to manipulate the images to provide an accurate imaging diagnosis. Um, the next thing is what we realize is that to, to get around the internet connectivity issues that, that having a cloud-based system was actually um, really important. These are fairly large data sets. And, um, you know, if, and we did attempt to just tap in directly to the hospitals, uh, log in directly to the hospital's computer system uh, via VPN. But we found it very challenging just because of um, slowness issues. And I think mostly stemming from the, uh, the connection that the hospital had to the internet. So what we found is using a cloud-based system, meaning that the, all the images, the data is first uploaded to a server um, you know, cloud-based server, you know, uh, so they, you know, even if it took a long time for the images to load, once they're uploaded into the cloud, then you're actually not access, you're accessing those images from the cloud and not from the hospital itself. And so that was one thing that we found as a critical um, um, step in, 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 in being able to perform the teleradiology. And finally, just there needs to be a method to report the CT scans um, formally. And um, this, this is a kind of a simpler part, I, but basically, um, just a, a way to transmit the information and, you know, most radio for, for our program, we're having radiologists, um, you know, basically write up the reports in a Microsoft Word or equivalent um, word processing program and saving the, the uh, images of PDF and then they're uploaded to the software that we use that can be accessed then back um, at the hospital. Dr. Chang? Yes. Um, hey, you may uh, be addressing this. Um, I'm just curious uh, with this cloud-based system, are there any special um, uh, steps that you uh, take to um, protect confidentiality of this information? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so I think that, you know, you know, the expectation is much just, you know, that the patients, that the, all the, the radiologists would treat this, this you know, the, in the same fashion as if they were, uh, you know, they, they were reading cases from their own practice. You know, many of the, pra you know, many radiology practices in the United States have actually gone remote and people are reading things from home. Mm -hmm. So in terms of protecting the information, um, you know, just on a personal level, we, you know, you know, the expectation is that radiologists are, you know, protecting them to the same extent they would, you um, uh, protect the information in their own practice. Okay. In terms of the software system itself, it's a HIPAA compliant um, system whereby there's, you know, you have to have an account access um, to access any of the images um, and um, everything's encrypted, et, et cetera. So, uh, right. so, that, um, so that takes care, the software itself also provides that level of uh, protecting the health information. Got you, all right, thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Well, now let me set, get into the volunteer teleradiology program itself, and you know how just kind of share about how how it started, and maybe and also some of the uh, mechanics of uh, you know of uh, how it works. Um, so you know, I took my first trip to uh, Tenwick Hospital in October 2013, and I was when I was having my wrap up meeting with uh, 
the, uh, with Dr. Mike Chupp, who was the uh, medical director at that time. He presented the need for teleradiology um, to, you know, um, to, uh, really mostly to, to interpret the CT scans um, while uh, no radiologist was on site, which again could be, you know, up to six, eight months uh, of the year. Um, so when I came back to the, to the United States, I, uh, together with several of the other radiologists who had been, uh, who had traveled to uh, Tenwick Hospital, um, we kind of explored different uh, ways to, uh, to do the teleradiology, which I'll get into the details in just a moment. Um, so in the spring of 2014, we actually began our teleradiology program. Um, and we started with uh, 25 volunteer radiologists. And, and most of these radiologists came, were radiologists who had uh, also had served on site um, either at, uh, at Tenwick Hospital or Kajabi Hospital or you know, had an interest in missions. Um, and uh, yeah, over the last uh, eight years, it's now really grown to, uh, you know, we have over 50 radiologists across the United States who are participating. Um, and uh, I have listed a, um, just a, um, some of the uh, states that are represented here. So you can see it's, uh, you know, quite a, um, broadly around the country, uh, radiologists are enthusiastically uh, uh, volunteering to uh, provide these teleradiology services. We also have a couple of radiologists in Canada. Uh, most of the radiologists are in private practice. We do have some um, academic radiologists um, who are participating as well. And, uh, and it's, it's pretty busy service. We, now, we are um, interpreting approximately 2,500 to 3,000 CT scans per year um, via teleradiology. And with increasing imaging volumes um, at the hospital, um, we're anticipating getting up to close to 4,000 scans per year. So um, these radiologists, uh, you know, it, it's really such a privilege to work with and to partner with all of them to, uh, uh, and collectively, I mean, it's amazing to the, the impact, the number of patients that um, we're able to, you know, help in their medical care, you know, although it's, not, you know, we're not on site, um, but providing the service, um, you know, really, uh, you, know, uh, you know, playing a role in helping to support um, the, uh, the clinicians there um, in, uh, in, uh, at Tenwick Hospital. And uh, the radiologists, uh, typically what we do on a weekly basis, we have a team of radiologists um, who, uh, and we uh, you know, usually seven or eight radiologists and uh, um, we split up the scans um, each day. And uh, most radiologists are working you know, during the day. And then when they come home, they interpret um, you know, several CT scans um, and uh, upload those uh, the reports to the, uh, the software service that we use. Dr. Chang, I'm just curious, um, uh, just real quickly, um, you mentioned you had five academic radiologists. Uh, I imagine some of the uh, CT imaging you see is quite remarkable, to say the least. I'm sure there's advanced um, disease um, and uh, very informative and educational. I didn't know if uh, we are affiliated with any um, academic institutions and, and just in sharing some of these images and, and just teaching uh, like uh, radiology residents, things of that mm -hmm. sort. Yeah, there, there's not a formal affiliation um, set up, but there is. Uh, there are radiologists that, uh, for example, there's a radiologist who's quite involved at the University of, uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison, and I know that he is. Uh, you know, he's presented. Um, you know, these uh, he uses these cases to to help uh, educate his residents. Right. Great. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, now, just to, you know, to get into some of the technical mechanics of the, the, the teleradiology program. So in March 2014, we began viewing the CT scans, um, and uh, we did not have any special software for this, um, you know, from the get-go. Um, but what we did, what we discovered, again, we tried to you know log in directly to the uh, to the uh, um, the computer at Tenwick via VPN, and found that that was not going to be practical, um, you know, because intuitively it seemed like it might be the best, you know, easiest solution. But instead. We realized what we need to do is we need to upload these CT scans up to a cloud-based solution. Um, in this case, we use Google Drive, very similar to a Dropbox. And so we had the, the, the radiology technologists download all the, the files for a certain CT scan, put in a folder, they'd upload it to Google Drive. It actually took like, I mean, some, in some cases, an hour and a half to two hours for a single CT scan to upload. But the nice thing was it was just occurring in the background. And once the whole thing was uploaded and radiologists in the United States could download that, that image file set, um, you know, within, you know, within 30 seconds or so, and then import it into a, a, a separate viewer program and go ahead and, and interpret the scan, type up a report, then email that back to Tenwick Hospital. So it was a pretty labor intensive process. I, this yellow box just shows all the different steps. You're not meant to read all the different, um, uh, the, the, all the different steps, but I knew this to say it was, it was pretty time intensive. It was prone to certain pitfalls um, just because there were so many manual steps. So, um, 
as exciting as it was, you know, and, we, and I still remember the first day when we, we received the first, uh, you know, I was able to view the first CT scan uh, from, uh, from Tenwick remotely. Um, we realized that this, this was not a sustainable long-term solution because it, just, it was a very labor-intensive workflow. So in 2015, actually, one of the radiologists who was participating introduced us. Um, she, she was aware of a software program, and it's called, in the broad category, a secure imaging exchange software program, and uh, introduced us to that company. And uh, at the time, it was a local San Diego company um, called RadConnect, and then it's been, the, uh, the product's now been purchased uh, by uh, Change Healthcare um, and is now called Stratus. But um, essentially the same idea, they were able to install a, uh, a uh, application on the computer at Tenwick. And what now what happens is as when a CT scan is uh, performed at Tenwick, those images are actually automatically uploaded into their HIPAA compliant um, server and stored up in, in, in their cloud um, server. And then radiologists can individually, wherever they are, with just a, with a, a, with a through a web browser, um, log into their own personal account, they're able to access the CT scans. And so this was really revolutionary for us to be able and a critical step forward for, you know, providing teleradiology. Um, and so you can see in these yellow boxes, we were eliminate, eliminate a lot of the steps and actually the steps that remain are, were also much more efficient because we, we took out a lot of the manual steps and, and there's a lot more automated. And so I guess just one of the takeaways for this, what, you know, whether it's for teleradiology or other telehealth things is that, um, you know, we, you really, I, you know, need an efficient, reliable, simple user-friendly solution because we are fi finding it we, when we deployed that first complex workflow to a broad range of radiologists of different te technical capabilities, different stages of their career, you know, it was very difficult to get people up to speed, but with a, with a more efficient, uh, simple system, it's been very easy to deploy to radiologists, you know, uh, around the country and, and the startup time is, is very quick and there's not too much of a learning curve. So now I'm going to talk about some of the clinical impacts of teleradiology. Um, so patients typically present to the hospital with very advanced or unusual diseases, mm -hmm. um, you know, compared to what we see here in the United States. So that really may, in turn makes accurate imaging diagnoses on CT critical um, for delivering um, patient care. And so I think this is where the radiologist input is essential. And, you know, many of these CTs are very, very challenging, even you know, some of our most, uh, uh, you know, expert radiologists who are in academics, some of them are head scratchers. Um, certainly a lot of these are, can be, you know, you know, head scratchers for me. And, uh, um, but so one of the other things that's really nice with, you know, once we, with the availability of all the, uh, the imaging on this um, cloud-based platform is we can also share the, uh, the images for expert second opinions, you know, whether within the teleradi you know, the teleradiologists um, that we have, or even other experts, um, you know, in academic medical centers have weighed in and, you know, they're interested in it. And I mean, I think it's pretty amazing that, you know, some of these, these patients, you know, from an image, you know, from a radiology care perspective have been receiving, you know, they'll get receive, um, you know, consultations on their imaging unbeknownst to them from some of the world experts in radiology. So I think that's pretty neat. Um, so just to give you an idea of some of the, um, the pathology that an example of some of the pathology that we see, here's a, a, a CT, some CT scan images from a 63 year old male that had progressive non painful thigh swelling associated with numbness and weight loss. So the first image on, on the left hand of the screen is what we call the scout topogram. It's kind of, you know, similar to a plain film image. Um, and you can see that in the um, inner aspect of the right um, Thigh, there's a tremendous, there's a very, very large mass that's actually splaying his, um, this patient's legs apart. Um, and so you can imagine this patient has waited quite a long time before finally seeking medical care. Hmm. Um, the next two images are CT scan images of that, of that um, mass. And you can see that it's a, it's a very complicated cystic and solid mass with some areas of ossification. And so the CT scan was able to guide the, uh, um, the, the surgical team in, um, how to uh, you know approach it? We you know we were able to give you know some you know our, from a radiology perspective, um, let them know that the, you know this is you know was concerning for you know a malignant neoplasm, and uh, the patient um, had this successfully resected, and uh, the pathology results were this was actually a, a very rare tumor called an ossifying fibromyxoid tumor. Another um, case is a 17-year-old male that had low back pain and the inability to walk for eight months, and finally presenting to the hospital. And these are multiple uh, CT images of the lumbosacral spine junction region. And you can see that the, the bones are diffusely abnormal with a uh, uh, mixed lytic and sclerotic process. Um, the patient also has what's called a pathologic fracture um, where with the blue arrows uh, designating that, meaning that the, the bone is so abnormal that it causes, that, that it, um, 
that um, it resulted in a fracture. Um, and not only that, you can see that there's a large infiltrative, heavily calcified lesion that's completely surrounding um, the lower lumbar spine and sacrum and invading the spinal canal. Mm. We got some additional images um, uh, further uh, um, uh, superior in the body. And you can see that the inferior vena cava where the, uh, on the left hand uh, um, image that there is a, there's a thrombus in the inferior vena cava that also with calcifications. Um, there were some images that went through the lung bases and there are multiple lung nodules. And so this is actually a CT scan that I was, I, ha I happened to be personally responsible for interpreting. And, um, and as I approached it, I actually consulted one of the other radiologists, a neuroradiologist um, who, uh, you know, has traveled to Tenwick many times and is an expert in his field. And uh, we kind of, we looked at it uh, together and uh, we, um, we actually thought that, that, you know, uh, favored that this was um, a, uh, a malignant tumor, perhaps a chondrosarcoma or osteosarcoma arising from the spine, um, just because of all, the, you know, the combination of findings. But uh, in the back of our minds, we all, you know, we also discussed that, you know, could this be tuberculosis just because tuberculosis is so prevalent? Well, so, uh, you know, we, we ended up reporting it as, you know, favored it was a tumor, but, you know, but tuberculosis would be in the differential. And so it turned out after further clinical workup, that this patient has a severe case of tuberculous osteomyelitis of the spine. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and the, the last follow-up that I got on the patient, the patient was um, undergoing, um, uh, treatment for TB and with a, then a uh, planned uh, um, surgical laminectomy infusion um, following his uh, medical treatment. And also just one final case study um, uh, with the clinical impact of teleradiology, um, how uh, radiologists have been able to uh, make a significant contribution to patient care. I will share about Paul's story. This is a patient that um, you know, presented at Tenwick Hospital Emergency Department um, six or seven years ago. Um, he had been in a motorcycle accident um, this is just this is a picture of you know a typical you know uh, uh, boda boda, which is a uh, motorcycle taxi that you know you see uh, around uh, Tenwick Hospital and other areas of rural Kenya quite frequently. So as you can imagine, as you can see you know from the picture, you know patients often can be unhelmeted and, and are going to be prone to um, uh, to uh, motorcycle um, accidents. So Paul was brought in, um, and the surgical team evaluated him and ordered a CT scan of his head and his cervical spine. Um, and um, since there's no radio, there was no radiologist on site and the, the, the surgical team and they're quite experienced in, you know, doing an initial evaluation of the imaging, they looked at the head CT themselves and they determined, you know, they didn't see any kind of intracranial um, traumatic injury, no calvarial fractures. Um, then they, they, they looked at the, uh, the cervical spine CT and also um, um, looked for fractures and they didn't see any fractures. Um, and they, so they were getting ready to, um, to go ahead and just discharge the patient um, um, from the hospital because they didn't see any injuries on the, the head or a cervical spine CT. So meanwhile, um, you know, literally halfway, almost literally halfway around the world, um, a radiologist in Chicago um, was, uh, was, uh, was um, uh, covering this, the teleradiology that day and he came across this scan. And so he looked at the head CT and he did not see any kind of intracranial um, traumatic injury. Um, he looked at CT cervical spine as well and he did not see any fractures. But when he um, moved to look at the soft tissue windows of the cervical spine CT, he noticed that there was bleeding around the spinal cord and epidural hematoma, which is a surgical emergency. So he quickly you know, uploaded his report, um, you know, delineating those findings. He also emailed the medical director at uh, Tenwick Hospital to let him know, hey, there's an important finding here I think that you need to know about. And um, fortunately for, for the patient, uh, the, uh, the report and, and the findings were communicated um, before the patient was discharged and it totally changed the course of his, uh, his uh, treatment because at the time there was no neurosurgeon at Tenwick. So they transferred the patient to a facility where he could get the, uh, um, the, uh, the surgery that he needed to evacuate that, that epidural hematoma. So tremendous impact, you know, if he were to discharge home, I mean, what, you know, um, certainly the outcome of could have been much, um, pretty bad. So uh, just tie, I'm going to tie up with just some additional facets and sort of future directions that we see uh, with teleradiology. Um, so one of the things that, uh, you know, especially during the COVID-19 um, pandemic is that there have been, uh, you know, there was one radiologist who had a, had a uh, trip planned, but the, the, because of the, the pandemic, the uh, country of Kenya was uh, closed to, you know, down to visitors. So he had to transition to a virtual a couple weeks of uh, service. And there was another radiologist who actually had a, a trip planned earlier this year. And, you know, in the, in the pre-flight uh, COVID testing, tested positive, so had to cancel his trip. So 
with with the availability of teleradiology, um, they were able to transition a little bit to, to a virtual um, sort of service of, for a couple of weeks. Um, you know, you know, moving a little bit towards more towards Kenyan time and reading the cases more contemporaneously, and then being available via um, you know applications such as WhatsApp or FaceTime to provide. Um, more real time, you know, face to face, uh, sort of virtual consultations on the, uh, the imaging. The other thing we've been able to do, and you know, for and it kind of plays in teleradiology and kind of telehealth in general, is being able to participate in multidisciplinary conferences. Um, uh, the tumor boards uh, at Kenwick are held via Zoom. Um, so one of the ways we've engaged, um, just because of the time difference challenges, is is recording videos that uh, you know run through. Um, Imaging with a with a radiologist voiceover, kind of uh, pointing out pertinent um, um, findings on the CT scan, uh, specific for that patient. Also answering any specific questions the clinical uh, team has. Um, also, or I, I've also logged into the Zoom before, and it's been pretty neat. I've seen you know surgeons for the United States also uh, logging in. So that's a way you know with with these uh, technologies being coming available, and we're able to participate um, you know more directly in some of these uh, patient care activities. Um, educational activities are another um, area of teleradiology that, that, that you know, or there, or we can do remotely, both just with asynchronous learning by recording videos, um, and also um, there, um, one of the radiologists have, has also um, done some live uh, video teaching conferences with some of the general surgery residents at Tenwick, um, um, you know, via a, a, a Zoom type format. Um, reviewing CT scans directly with them. So those are different areas that can be developed. And I think that there's a, you know, a lot of opportunity there um, to, for education, especially with you know, training programs at many of these mission hospitals mm -hmm. in, uh, in Africa. Um, and the education kind of goes both ways. As, as Lance already talked about earlier, um, uh, the, the cases that are rarely seen in the United States can also be used for residency training, mm -hmm. um, where um, especially the academic radiologists can um, let uh, you know can help educate um, radiology uh, radiology trainees in the United States on on uh, disease processes that you know are not uh, seen very um, often, if at all, in the U.S. And I think along with that increases awareness for some of the global health needs um, in radiology, and hopefully will encourage some of these younger um, trainees to one day also um, go ahead and serve um, in uh, some of these uh, these low resource settings where you know the uh, the, the role of radiologists can be significant. Um, there's also been opportunities to do global health research, having the availability of all these CT scans um, uh, has been able to enable the, uh, um, you know, research on the types of diseases and things like that, which would not be available um, if, you know, if all the CT scans were just, you know, were not accessible. Um, and finally, I think one of our visions actually to have the opportunity to train and partner with radiologists in Kenya. Um, and I think that I envision that teleradiology will play a major role, uh, you know, especially if there's not a, uh, a you know, an onsite in radiologist. Um, this will give the opportunity either for a staff radiologist to, you know, consult and partner with a uh, you know, radiologist in the United States, um, you know, and, and, you know, collaborate on, on difficult cases. And also certainly for residency, if there were, you know, one day there were a residency program that we could participate in um, at Tenwick for radiology um, to, to do a lot of the teaching uh, remotely and also um, oversight and training. Mm -hmm. Um, finally, there's a, um, a la last slide. Um, it's actually been really neat to see the growth of Teleradio at Mission Hospitals. Um, these are a few of the World Med Medical Mission um, affiliated hospitals that I'm aware of that participate in, uh, in teleradiology. A hospital, Diospi Siana in Peru is a, a smaller operation than Tenoic, but there are a handful of us, myself included, that help to, to read the teleradiology there in a similar fashion that we do um, as we do at Tenoic. Um, and Bingo um, Baptist Hospital in Cameroon um, has a, an interesting setup there. They actually have a, a Cameroonian radiologist um, there and, uh, and, and faculty at the uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham, UAB, help support him. Um, currently, they're, they're uh, providing overreads and training of his CT scans with the idea that as he gains more confidence and experience, that they'll be able to release him and he'll be able to have more and more independence. And finally, Soto Hospital in Ethiopia, um, is a, uh, UAB staff also has had a, um, you know, pretty much for, for the same, around the same time period that we started at Tenwick, have been supporting um, that hospital with teleradiology as well. So I just want to thank you so much, uh, yeah, for the opportunity to uh, share about uh, um, radiology and teleradiology um, at Tenwick Hospital. And, uh, you know, I think it's, a, you know, just in conclusion, I mean, it's a very exciting time for uh, 
for radiology as more and more of this advanced imaging, uh, CT scanners and uh, MRIs, um, hopefully down the, pretty soon, become available at Mission Hospitals. Just to, and that just increases the opportunities and significant uh, roles that radiologists can play. And I, you know, the first time when I looked in 2012 for radiology needs on the World Med website, there were only uh, Kajabi and Tenwick Hospital were listed as uh, as needing radiologists. And you know, I just I just took a glance at it uh, the other night, and there's over a dozen hospitals that have a, a need for radiologists. So I think this is an area that's just going to continue to grow. So thank oh. you very much. All right. Well, Dr. Chang, thank you so much. That was uh, great clarity and uh, and tremendous information about uh, teleradiology and and just the way it's moving forward. Um, just uh, want to remind um, our viewers um, to post their questions uh, in their chat box. And um, please take this opportunity uh, to um, ask Dr. Chang any, any questions. Um, Dr. Chang, um, just uh, want to say, um, you know, we, we uh, talked briefly before we got started. These really are pioneering times um, for uh, radiology. And I think uh, broad, more broadly um, in, in uh, medicine um, with telemedicine, um, I can say um, uh, at World Medical Mission during the pandemic, there was a lot of people that could not uh, travel internationally because of the restrictions from COVID. But um, we uh, also just recognized that there could be just tremendous applications associated with not only teleradiology, but telemedicine in general. Um, so um, we're uh, at Samaritan's Purse, we're taking a much closer look at, um, uh, at telemedicine. And I think it really is um, exciting times. Um, so um, certainly with yourself, with teleradiology, I think there's a lot of opportunity for growth there, but also uh, other subspecialties like uh, we mentioned histopathology. Um, there's mm -hmm. incredible opportunity to diagnose some of these um, cancers before they become uh, advanced. Um, and uh, I think that's one area where there could be a, a lot of uh, impact um, in our mission hospitals. And so anyway, we're just um, starting to explore these opportunities, but uh, I, Really want to thank you for uh, the work that you have done uh, there at Timwick to develop this program. So um, I wanted to ask you, um, you said you're uh, at about 50 uh, radiologists. Um, if, uh, how, how do, if there are uh, radiologists uh, listening to this program today, how do they become involved with this program? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, um, they can just contact World Medical Mission, mm -hmm. and uh, the staff there will uh, get them connected with uh, myself or one, you know one of the uh, other teleradiology leaders, and um, and then we can you know explain the process to get them um, involved. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Um, um, so uh, I'm just curious. Do um, is there a need for more radiologists right now, or, or are you pretty uh, saturated, or uh, how's that working out? Mm -hmm. I think we, you know, we're always happy to, uh, to onboard uh, to have more radiologists. It's helpful, especially with the imaging volume growing. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, so we would welcome a, a, any radiologists that are interested in, in joining us for sure. And I think as, as that cardiothoracic care center, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, expands, I, I, I do envision the needs for radiologists will just continue to grow there. Yeah, I think so. And I, I hope um, just with the, um, with the um, development of the cardiothoracic center, as I mentioned, I hope um, that um, we uh, can develop the other aspects of telemedicine and, and kind of join you in your endeavor there. So um, it's exciting just to have this kind of opportunity um, just to collaborate collectively, you know, just on a global basis and, and share information. So, um, yeah. So, Dr. Chang, um, there is so far there are no questions um, that I see that are posed. So you did a, a tremendous job in uh, presenting this program today. So just really want to thank you um, for all you're doing again and uh, just your service there at Timwick Hospital and at World Medical Mission here at Samaritan's Purse. So. Um, yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, just going to wrap things up here, um, just as a uh, want to remind everybody um, that this has been approved for AMA uh, uh, Category 1 credit. And we will be sending a follow-up email uh, with the instructions uh, to a link to this recording. If you are not uh, on our email uh, list, you can join the forum at health.samaritanspurse.org and be the first to know about upcoming events and, and our next webinar presentation. Our next one will actually be um, uh, at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time on uh, June the 8th. Um, and uh, it is uh, with uh, my uh, colleague and good friend, Dr. Ararat Karachatani, who I happened to meet uh, in, um, 
uh, in northern Iraq in um, uh, uh, 2017. So with that, just thank you guys for joining us today. Just pray that uh, the rest of your day is blessed. Uh, thank you for joining us. God bless.